So thank you everybody for coming to the Soil Health Conference. Um, we've been a participant in this conference since it started and I, Sarah, you do a great job every year and uh, what a great turnout and um, I hope you guys are learning a lot. And, um, I've been asked to come here today to talk to you guys about how selenium uh, task force activities benefit soil health in the agricultural community. It's a good thing I didn't want my tiara because this would have interfered with the <laughs> little strange to get used to. Just tell me when the, just give me a notch when you Okay, want. so uh, next. Uh, who is the Selenium Task Force? The Denison, Grayson, and Grand Valley Selenium Task Force is a group of private, local, regional, state, and federal interests that got together and are looking for ways to reduce selenium in our local waterways while maintaining the economic viability and agricultural heritage of our area. The task force was established back in 1998 when the state of Colorado listed the Gunnison and Colorado rivers and many of their associated tributaries as being water quality impaired for selenium. What this means is that under the Federal Clean Water Act, when streams don't meet a standard for a pollutant, in this case selenium, it's placed on what's called a 303D list. And um, states are encouraged to work with local communities to address these water quality issues. Um, one second here. Uh, next slide. And so, what is selenium? Selenium is basically a naturally occurring element that's required in very small amounts for all animals. Um, it's a natural component of our local geology, uh, specifically the Manka shale soils found here in the lower Venison Basin. And when water comes into contact with these soils, selenium is then mobilized and it moves into the groundwater system and into our local waterways. This is a schematic of how um, selenium is picked up in irrigation water. Basically, selenium comes from the Gunnison, or selenium, water comes from the Gunnison Tunnel and comes into our canal systems, which are open and earthen, at least in the Uncompagre project area. That water is basically one part per billion, so it's very, very low in terms of selenium uh, levels. But once that water deperks through the, through the soils underneath the canal system, or when water is applied to the top of a, a, an agricultural field, it deperks through those soils when you apply more than you need, which happens in often in flood irrigation and it continues to pick up selenium as it moves towards a river system. Now there's a lot of irrigation drains around the lower Gunnison Basin and the Grand Valley, so these drains often pick up that water again, that groundwater moves into those drainage systems and you find concentrations of anywhere from 20 to 200 parts per billion. Now the state standard for selenium in terms of water quality compliance is 4.6, so at 20 to 200 we're way above that. That water that's in the drains can continue to move towards the river system. Um, and it's not just an agricultural issue. Selenium mobilization and loading is also an issue associated with urban development. Um, soils that have been previously non irrigated are up to 34 times higher in soluble selenium than those soils that have been irrigated for over 100 years in some parts of the valley. Uh, that's an issue that we look at in terms of future growth and development. You know, prior to 1903, there was, of course, some agriculture in the water in the basin, but when the Uncompahgre River ran dry before farmers could finish irrigating their crops, there was no more water. So farmers got together and were able to convince the federal government that a tunnel should be built to bring water from the Gunnison River to this valley. And since then, agriculture flourished. And these are some of the old holographs of the Gunnison Tunnel when it was being constructed. Next slide. In the Gunnison River, our situation is unique. In the Gunnison River Basin, our situation is unique. And it's complicated by the fact that we also have endangered species that occupy the lower Gunnison and Colorado rivers. This sets into play a whole new layer of issues related to the security of our water supplies. We now have the Endangered Species Act affecting water quality and land use management decisions in the Gunnison Basin. And we have what's called a programmatic biological opinion that was issued by the Department of the, excuse me, the Department of uh, the Fish and Wildlife Service. And basically this opinion was written in response to reclamation re-operating the Aspinall unit for the benefit of the endangered fish. They wanted to have more natural flows at certain specific times of the year when it was important for spawning and for the fish. Now what the opinion basically said from the Fish and Wildlife Service is that 
if ongoing activities, irrigation activities, were going to occur in the basin, there would continue to be a selenium problem. And selenium is harmful to fish when it's in high concentrations. It causes um, uh, problems with reproduction. It causes deformations in the spine and things like that. So now this is an additional driver here in the basin and a concern. What the opinion also said is that if we're going to continue to irrigate here in the basin, that we have to develop what's called a conservation measure or a selenium management program. This selenium management program would have to mitigate for the effects of ongoing irrigation on selenium loading. The Selenium Task Force has been a stakeholder in the selenium management program, which is being led by the Bureau of Reclamation. In 2011, uh, the program was completed, and since then we've been working on implementation of all the different components. And basically, the selenium management program was modeled a lot in part on what the selenium task force had been doing for 10 or 12 years before the, the biological opinion was written. But it greatly accelerated those efforts and the involvement of a lot of the local entities and agencies involved, such as Reclamation, Fish and Wildlife Service, BLM, and RCS. And it was also very important for the stakeholders and water users of this basin, um, because obviously they have a stake in ensuring that their water supplies are secure and that we do some proactive to address selenium loading. Next slide. So what task force activities uh, occur that benefit soil health? Well, there's probably four things um, I've uh, identified, such as the political support that our group can pr provide. Um, we also work to implement off-farm irrigation delivery system improvements, such as piping and lining. We're starting to focus more on on-farm irrigation efficiency and we conduct research and studies. And as far as political support goes, um, we re our stakeholders um, are working to educate uh, local land use planners and county commissioners about selenium issues. Um, I think there's a perception that agriculture is going to solve the problem um, when I don't think our the amount of um, acreage going into agricultural production is increasing. If anything, I think it's probably decreasing. And so we need to be cognizant of that and aware of the potential issues when we send urban growth and development into these non-irrigated soils that are high in selenium. We also testify at uh, the state level about the benefits of our um, selenium task force and selenium management program action plans to demonstrate to the Water Quality Control Division and others that we are having a positive impact on the, on the issue and problem. We've been able to remove approximately 29% of the selenium in our local waterways as measured at the Gunnison River at Whitewater, Colorado. And that's been since 1986. So it's not, it's, it's not a problem that's going to be solved quickly. Um, it's something that we need to continue to keep working on, and uh, both at, at the agricultural level and at the um, urban and uh, residential growth areas. And finally, we also have the ability ability to lobby for additional funding in support of selenium reduction activities. Off-farm delivery system, um, the piping projects that we do, our goal is to reduce selenium loading by eliminating um, the deep percolation of water from those open earthen laterals and canals. Uh, we've worked extensively with the Uncompahgre Valley Water Users Association to uh, get uh, salinity control projects in place that reduce selenium and salt loading. What benefits does this have towards the agricultural community and soil health? When you develop pressurized systems, you have the ability to convert to more uh, efficient irrigation systems on your farm. We also develop additional water supplies. When you pipe or line, or you put an open ditch into pipe, you prevent a lot of that water that was being lost from the system from going into the groundwater. You now have additional supplies to help get you through times as we've been experiencing a uh, very intense drought. Um, and it, when you also pipe and line the systems, it also creates stable and reliable water supplies, which should help to improve on-farm irrigation efficiency. And finally, um, it's a benefit for selenium reduction. You don't have those laterals um, seeping water into the, into the soils and picking up selenium salts. This, uh, here are some photos of um, some of the piping projects that we've done with the Uncompahgre Valley water users. Um, we've also done some on-farm metering, so every uh, turnout structure has a meter on it, and we'll start to impl implement those throughout the system too. In terms of the off-farm delivery system, we also do lining projects. 
Our goal is to demonstrate the economic feasibility and modified methods of lining that could work in make shell soils. And the benefits include uh, selenium reduction, salt reduction, uh, and developing new water supplies. This is a photo of a mining project that occurred on the East Sea Canal in the Okupagui project in 2010. Um, what they did was basically apply a geomembrane liner over the bottom of the canal and then put this geofabric or web over the top. And then what they did is brought a truck, a cement truck along and filled up those webs or cells with the cement which helps to keep all uh, the liner and everything in place. Now this was a demonstration project that started out at 0.3 miles um, but was extended because they found that they were actually able to construct the project at half of what we initially budgeted. So we definitely demonstrated the economic feasibility of it. Um, so far, they've had great success. The canals look great, the cement stayed in place, the liner's working well. Um, on the bottom of the canal, you can see that there's some cobble under there. And they put the cobble down on the bottom of the canal system in order to allow the water to have a flow path to follow so that it wouldn't get under that cement and cause it to buckle. And that worked great. I mean, it worked very well. But the problem that they had was that uh, there's significant moth growth that occurred, moss growth that occurs in these canal systems, and it was able to adhere to those that cobble. And so that was uh, a maintenance kind of issue for them on that. So we'll have to see what we do if we do another section with it. They'll just eliminate the cobble and just go with the uh, straight cement. Um, we also work to um, establish an off-farm and on-farm nexus with the work that we do. So you can be piping and lining canals, but if that doesn't benefit the farmer, well, then it really doesn't do you any good. If you're going to develop high-pressured systems, you have to be able to tie that to the on-farm part. So we're working towards the goal of facilitating continued organized piping and lining activities while also addressing the changes that it brings in terms of the management of your water. Um, obviously, a pipe system is going to work very differently than an open gravity fed system where you have to charge your canal completely before your water will flow and everything like that. So um, we've been working on some um, system optim design, optimization uh, planning efforts with the Irrigation Training and Research Center from Cal Poly Tech. Uh, they've done a lot of stuff in Utah and um, California and other places and um, they're doing a great job so far and we should be able to present the results of that um, project probably at the end of 2014. Again, the benefits are selenium reduction from off-farm and on-farm improvements. Uh, it also uh, enables improved irrigation water management because you have more stable water supplies. And uh, we're hoping that it leads to on-farm irrigation system improvements so that we can gain uh, uh, some selenium reduction from there. This is just a conceptual drawing of what uh, process we've gone through and, and what kind of activities we go through. Um, a typical system optimization analysis will look at you know, your, your, um, the length of your pipe, how much water it carries. We also look at where there's duplication in the systems. It doesn't make any sense to have two laterals or canals running parallel to each other that can serve a single area. So we looked at combining systems and eliminating some of them, making it more, more efficient. And you get selenium and salinity reduction benefits from that. Um, so this is kind of what, what it looks like. We also look at a design summary and uh, come up with some capital construction cost estimates. And at the end of it, when everything's done and they've looked at all the different canal systems, we'll have a step-by-step -step process of how to optimize the Uncompagri project area system, delivery system. On-farm uh, irrigation efficiency and soil health. Our goal is to encourage on-farm irrigation system efficiency so that we can implement soil health practices and demonstrate new technologies and our innovative ideas. Um, the benefits include, of course, selenium loading, pressurized delivery systems, stable and reliable and clean water supplies, and hopefully with um, uh, pressurized systems you can convert to more efficient irrigation technology and implement more of your soil health practices. Uh, we've implemented or are in the process of trying to implement several projects. In 2002, we implemented a uh, center pivot irrigation demonstration project at the Meeker Farm in Montrose, Colorado. Um, this was one of the first center pivots put in in the valley in Mancashell adobe soils. Um, for years, they had said that, and I think it was even tried, that some of these center pivot systems could not work in the valley, and indeed they did fail. 
you know, 10 or 15 years earlier, but technology had cut up. There were some improvements, and um, Mr. Meeker is a very innovative farmer, and he felt that he could get these systems to work. He did his research, and he looked at other areas where they were being employed, and was able to convince um, the Basin States Parallel Program to support his project. And uh, since then, I have heard that up to 40 or more center pivots have been put in in the valley. We're also working currently to uh, implement a big gun irrigation demonstration and soil health demonstration project. Um, we're once again working with Mr. Meeker. We've had um, several projects go on on his property and we've got um, irrigation wells set up all over. We've got a tree farm. We've got all kinds of stuff out there that really lends to the site's uh, ability to conduct research and, and a demonstration project. Um, you might be asking why big guns? On the east side of the Uncompagri project, we don't have a lot of the high value crops that are produced on the west side. The soil's not as good. Um, so the ability or desire to move towards more efficient irrigation systems might not quite be there like it might be on the west side. In addition, um, on the east side of the Uncompagri project is where most of the very high selenium soils are. And if you're a farmer and you are limited by the shape of your farm, you know, maybe you have an interest in center pivots, but your farm is just not conducive to putting one in, um, you might be limited in your choices. So Big Gun is probably the next viable option on the east side of the Uncompagri project. You're probably not going to put in a drip system just because of the labor associated with working in with something like that, and, and the fact that drip systems are often used mainly on high value crops. And maybe automation is an important part to you as you um, want to reduce your farm inputs. We are currently in the process of trying to develop some preliminary designs and determine feasibility. And, and when I say we, I mean Mr. Meeker and the Selenium Task Force. Um, he's put in a significant amount of research and time into this, and so. Anytime we do demonstration projects or work with our farmers, it's going to be very important that we have your continued involvement and input on our projects. Um, so we're working together to implement the project in conjunction with the NRCS under their EQIP program, and we're currently fundraising for the project in order to help with the landowner cost share portion of it. Next one, sir. Am I ahead of you? One, go back one. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. So the other thing that we do is our research and studies, and again, our goal is to develop tools and experiment with new technologies and to contribute to our understanding of selenium loading and transport mechanisms. The benefits of our research and studies incur include the development of new tools that hopefully can be picked up by other people, uh, selenium reduction implementation strategies, including soil health practices, uh, and it allows us to get access to funding uh, and it hopefully changes policy. Um, next slide. So what research or studies are we involved in? Well, the big gun on-farm irrigation demonstration project that I mentioned earlier was important not only for demonstrating demonstration purposes, but there's also a lot that we can learn from in terms of research, research and studies. Uh, for instance, what are the associated water quality benefits when you go to a more efficient irrigation system in high shell adobe soils. Uh, we'd like to look at what kind of selenium and salinity reduction we can get. From a water resource perspective, we're also currently working in conjunction and collaboration with other groups like the No Chico Brush Group, Trout Limited, and the Nature Conservancy to try to get some funding to look at water resource implications of irrigation efficiency projects. And we're not just interested in big guns, but we're also interested in drip systems too, and uh, additional center pivots. <coughs> From a soil health perspective, we want to know how soil health practices implemented under big gut systems contribute to selenium load reduction through improved water and nutrient holding capacity associated with healthier soils. Uh, we don't have a number for that, and so it'd be really important to demonstrate that if we're going to get additional uh, help to implement practices here in the basin. Now this pretty lake map here was developed um, in a project where the Colorado River Water Conservation District, the Selenium Task Force, NRCS, uh, Dave Deerstein, and the Delta Conservation District collaborated to carry out a conservation innovation grant under NRCS. Now this picture speaks volumes as to the extent of the selenium issues in the Lower Gunnison Basin. Um, these maps were done, I think, in 2010, David, if I'm right, or around there. And there's currently uh, a project in play 
space where NRCS and Dave and some interns are working to do additional soil mapping of uh, different mancus members. And um, also taking that data, they're sending a lot of uh, the soil cores that they take to the NRCS um, lab in Nebraska. And they're also working in conjunction with trying to, uh, with Colorado Geological Survey, because they've recently done some additional mapping in the area. And we want to refine these maps um, and get a better picture of, of selenium in the basin. This map has been instrumental in securing additional funding to help implement both off-farm and on-farm selenium reduction activities. As a coordinator and a grant writer, I can't emphasize enough how important these kind of tools are when we're trying to target projects or when I'm help, trying to help secure additional funding. Um, it allowed, it, the picture speaks volumes, as you can see, but it helps us to get funding from the Colorado River Basin Salinity Control Fund, from the Environmental Quality Incentive Program, the Basin States Parallel Programs, Colorado Species Conservation Trust Funds, and on and on. So, um, thanks, Dave. This, is, this, was, this has been huge. It's been used a lot. And uh, just a couple more minutes and I'll get out of your hair. Um, we have um, a soil coral core and column study that's being conducted by the U.S. Geological Survey. Um, it was just recently completed and a report is being written. Um, and I wanted to highlight this project. I mean, we've done a lot of different research and studies, but this one's kind of important um, because probably about 10 to 15 years ago, a report was published that indicated that nitrate um, was keeping selenium in a more mobilized state and that it was due to uh, fertilizer or nitrate inputs from agriculture. What we found in our study was that the nitrate is actually naturally occurring. It's associated with the ge geology in the area. And in fact, the Lower Gunnison Basin and some of the tributaries here have some of the highest nitrate concentrations found in any agricultural area but it's due to our geology. It's not due to the nitrate inputs um, that are coming from fertilizers. There may be some of it, but it's certainly not the major process controlling it. It's just a natural part of our geology. Um, so what they basically did is looked at um, irrigated and non-irrigated um, soil cores and um, subjected their, those cores to laboratory experiments and looked at how fast the leaching rates or how fast that selenium came off those soils. And again, leaching rates were highest in non-irrigated soils, and they had high concentrations of background nitrate levels uh, when exposed to water, and that nitrate kept that, kept that selenium in a more mobilized form. Um, in irrigated soils, they found it, it was actually depleted. They didn't find a lot of nitrate those first five feet of the soils. And so, uh, once again, I think this speaks a lot to the fact that we need to be cognizant about how we develop in the Lower Gunnison Basin Ground Valley, and uh, we need to do it in a smart manner. Uh, so finally, um, I'd like to thank you for letting me have 30 minutes of your time, and I hope I've been able to demonstrate how Selenium Task Force activities benefit soil health practices uh, and the ag community in the Uncompahgre Valley and, and other parts of the Lower Gunnison Basin. Um, as we move toward emphasizing on-farm practices, um, the input and involvement of our local farmers is very important to our group. We want your input, we want your ingenuity, and I encourage you to please contact me if you have any ideas on how we can help you um, and what we can do to help facilitate on farm soil health improvements. I know I'd love to sit down and have coffee with any of you at any time, so please feel free to call me. I've included my contact information here, and I will be um, uh, at the Soil Health Conference both uh, the rest of today and tomorrow. So thank you.